The SGGQA podcast is brought to you in part by GigaDrive. GigaDrive is the world's fastest external solid state drive, delivering up to 2,800 megabyte per second read and write speeds. That means you can transfer 100 gigabytes of data in about 35 seconds. Compatible with Mac, PC, and Linux, you can connect GigaDrive over Thunderbolt 3, Thunderbolt 4, and USB-C with support for USB 4. This cutting edge drive is available in storage sizes up to four terabytes of capacity, and the aluminum casing prevents overheating. Nothing should slow you down while you're working. With so much data in such a small form factor, GigaDrive is built rugged, 10 foot drop in shock resistant, and it can survive a swim, three meters underwater for up to 30 minutes. Plus, I think it looks pretty cool. GigaDrive absolutely blew past its goals on Indiegogo, and there are still plenty of great offers available to help you take your mobile storage game to the next level. Check out the project page by going to bit.ly slash gd some gadget guy. Once again, bit.ly slash gd some gadget guy to grab a GigaDrive of your very own. Big thumbs up to GigaDrive for supporting this podcast, and now let's get into the show. All right, I believe this means we are live. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, tech fans of all shapes and sorts and sizes and persuasions, welcome to another episode of the Monday Morning Tech Chat Show on the SGGQA podcast channel. I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell, the Some Gadget Guy, or the, not the Some Gadget Guy, I'm Some Gadget Guy, but that's the SGG of this terribly named podcast series. The QA, of course, is the important part, as we like to have that question and answer, make this an interactive conversation. We can chat out news stories, follow up with the, you know, what's happening in the world of tech and make sure that we're all keeping abreast of that situation. And uh... (laughs) Dave Burns, gross, it's Juan. I was hoping TK would have taken over. At some point, I'm going to have to start talking about like guest hosts and stuff. Actually, one, one of the people, and we, we did talk about this behind the scenes. Um, I, I want to have Adam Dowd on uh, Benefit of the Dowd and, and have him you know, as like a guest host uh, for, for some of these. Is like, you know, if I'm having a, a, a really tough week getting through video projects, he, he's, he's exactly the kind of guy um, I'd like to, to, to see back up a show like this. But I hope everyone had a phenomenal weekend. I'm kind of flying already. I was up at at six in the morning and in like six in the morning, Marie had already been up to to brew some coffee. And from like 615 till now, I've been flying on editing video pieces. I've got an interview that's going to be coming out for reviews.org. Um, I've been cobbling together a major project uh, for, from a company that I can't talk about. Uh, if, if you noticed, if you're catching this on the live stream, our very first in video video uh sponsor uh, that played at the beginning of this podcast. There have been companies that have worked to to sort of sponsor uh, the podcast in the past, but this is this is the first time I actually got video assets to put together um, a, a pre-roll like that. It's just been it's just been all over the place. So uh, I, I didn't get much time to unplug this weekend. We, we've got a, a coming storm of gadgets to review uh, coming down the pipe. We're going to talk a little bit about some of those companies uh, in the second half of the uh, uh, during the gadget block. And we've got a lot of news. Um, thankfully, the news block, while there's a lot of news to talk about, a lot of this is follow up. Um, like I said, the the way I like to handle news I don't like it when we just sort of outrage over a headline and then kind of forget that there's still stuff happening after that initial surge, after that initial headline. So quite a bit, quite, quite, quite a bit, quite a bit. And I'm already seeing a phenomenal group here. I'm already going to have to take a drink of water. (laughs) Ah, Already seeing... A wonderful collection of folks here in the live stream. Ray Mondit, Dave Burns, Gary the Fireman, Vazako, Sotaku, Aditya. Uh, who, who, who was saying that it was their very first ER-1980? Heike had to, had, dropped by. He'll be back later uh, in the broadcast. Gormlord. Gormlord, your very first SGGQA. Welcome to the live stream. All right. Oh, and Ozzy Beachbum. Hey, my buddy from down under in Kyoto Santi. 
<laughs> I always stumble on your name. All right, we, we've we've got to jump in, and I'm going to be doing a ton of talking. Chatty boy, hola, que tal? Um, I'm going to be doing a ton of talking, and uh, I'm, I am actually worried about my voice holding out. Thankfully, I didn't do 20 hours of talking like I did the week before. Uh, last week was was a lot of was really production heavy. Um, and, and one of the major housekeeping points was just trying to stay somewhat on the pulse for some of the phones that we've got coming through to review. So let's dig in. Um, housekeeping. Housekeeping still going to take some time. I only had one major video go up on, on the channel on some gadget guy, uh, but it was a really good one. And it's one that I know is not going to get a ton of traffic thanks to YouTube. Uh, basically, uh, I, I want to use harsher language. Thanks to YouTube not really putting my video out for all of the people who subscribe to my channel. Let's just put it that way, without the swearing that I was going to do. So this is the QNAP QORA. Quora. I have no idea how to pronounce the name, but it's the 301W. This is a Wi-Fi 6 router that also supports 10 gigabit ethernet. I am super Twitter-pated about faster cabled networking. And uh, the uh, I, I, I'm, I've been meaning to do more follow-ups on my home network. Uh, I, I had miserable experiences with the Western Digital NAS. Um, I've switched over to a QNAP. I also got a QNAP switch just to kind of help manage some of this stuff. And all of these devices can interconnect over a 10 gigabit ethernet. Getting the router for that last stage with Wi-Fi 6 and 10 gig has been really nice. Um, it, it's just surprising. This is gross overkill for home networking, going 10 gig when I, I don't even have fiber here. I don't even have gigabit ether, uh, a gigabit, gigabit internet. Um, but connecting devices locally where I'm streaming video to a TV and then my wife's phone backups uh, for when she shoots video and photos, everything got crazy fast. Um, but but I did want to, oh, I didn't pull the video up. Let me see if I can just stream it here real quick. Um, I, I did want to show my awesome new animation skills. So I don't know, you know, I, some people have like nunchuck skills. Um, I've got, I, I, I uh, couldn't hold the router while shooting my A-roll. So in, instead, I, I did this as like a little gimmick because it's silly when you hold the device when you're talking about it. And uh, I, I just thought that was kind of fun. All right, uh, moving right along. Next up for housekeeping, uh, for reviews.org, we, we did a quick primer on Wi-Fi signals. Uh, you know, Wi-Fi 6 is pretty hot and eventually we're gonna start getting some Wi-Fi 6 extended products. But even still, it's it's always kind of interesting to me when people um, when people aren't really always clear about like the difference between 2.4 gig Wi-Fi and 5 gig Wi-Fi and what products should use which bands. So we put together just a, a little primer, a little tutorial. It's always nice to, to cover some of the basics and, and try and help someone clean up their home networking. And then uh, of course, TK and I, we did a, a stream last Thursday, best of our week, episode 13, where we, we kind of talked out OnePlus and my router and the, the OnePlus watch that's coming out. But honestly, last week was, was a bit of a week. And uh, if you catch that live stream, it's TK and I, just both of us burnt to a crisp. I mean, not in any kind of pharmaceutical way, like in a man, work was tough this week kind of way and uh and maybe in the middle of that show we had to take a break for me to just absolutely uh crush tk at some tetris um I, he's he's threatening now to get me back with some call of duty because i'm pretty sure he's gonna merc me uh pretty good but when it comes to tetris i you know i feel i feel like i can hold my own i feel like i can hold my own pretty decently especially for being kind of a controller player i'm not i'm not as good at keyboard as i used to be but the um, the uh, <laughs> Dave Burns, who doesn't want to play J. Estris? Um, get ganked. So, yeah, uh, I, I've been haunting J. Estris a bit more frequently of late. And it's it's a lot of fun. And especially you set up your own private room. You just have some friends over, play some Tetris. Tetris is, is now and forever. It's, it's, it's like one of my video game all-time loves. So uh, I, I, like, uh, <laughs> I like revisiting it on the regular. All right, now the biggie. 
the uh, the the thing that kind of chewed up a good chunk of of the end of my week and through the weekend, I finally got all the pieces in place to finish up and produce my Galaxy S twenty one camera deep dive. So this is one of the Patreon exclusive videos. It's thirty minutes long, and uh, the S twenty one is a is a good camera. I, I mean, I I feel it's a it's a competitive shooter. I feel this is a um, this is a weird year for Samsung. Uh, when when you look at a phone that's still priced premium tier, I mean it's you know when we start talking like seven hundred, eight hundred dollars, you know Galaxy S twenty one. This would also mostly apply to the S twenty one plus. Um, I know Samsung has sales. I know they've got the the goodest trade in deal, so you can get rid of a phone that's working perfectly fine and get a couple hundred bucks off your Samsung so that they can disrupt the used market and Samsung can throw their weight around like Walmart. Um, I was a little conflicted about coming up with a conclusion for a phone that performs very similarly to the phone we had last year and lacks some of the quality of life benefits of like things like having expandable storage where I still think it's really silly to be talking up big 4K and 8K video um, when, you know, you top out at 256 gig. Uh, again, I, I, I don't like this direction Samsung's heading. Um, I, I feel like there are different expectations placed on Google Pixels and OnePluses. Um, I miss a Samsung that, that competed by including all of these other peripheral uh, features and accessories and benefits. If I want a OnePlus, I'll get a OnePlus. If I want a Samsung, I want a Note 4. <laughs> so 30 minutes. I'm, I'm, I'm debating whether or not I, I did a cut down uh, for a camera conclusion to put up on the YouTubes. Um, I, I think I am going to still post this one, but I'm, I'm conflicted on whether or not I'm going to bother uh, continuing to do those those cut down videos, so we'll see. Um, right now, traffic on YouTube has been abysmal. Like uh, sharing is the lowest it's ever been. Video views are the lowest they've ever been. Um, getting comments on videos, this is like the worst it's ever been. And and it sucks because I feel like I put out the initial first impressions video where I I, I was kind of pointedly saying uh, that the S twenty one is not a good buy. And I saw like a little nudge in my viewership and then everything else that wasn't Samsung or Apple related just tanked. And again, like YouTube kind of front loaded. Oh, you, you got a little success talking about a more popular uh, product. You should just stick with that. And now it's like this negative reinforcement cycle coming directly from YouTube analytics. So again, it kind of reinforces like maybe I should just pivot my channel completely off to like <laughs> never talking about Samsung or Apple. Um, yeah, it's, it's a bit frustrating, but that was a huge one. It's a 30 minute video. And, uh, I, I feel like there are some legitimate concerns to show off in terms of performance, um, uh, in terms of photo processing, color science, all of those, you know, fancy terms that influencers like to use, but like, you know, they don't really examine, um, this is this is a very difficult camera for me to just sum up. A Sony is easy, right? Do you like alphas? Well, it's an alpha in your pocket. And it's got a dedicated shutter button. Like, that's cake. Samsung is, is a bit more of a challenge because I feel there are warring ideologies of, like, the pukiest unicorn saturation Instagram versus some legitimately great pro modes. Um, and I don't think that message ever really properly gets through like for example um like i got a comment from one of one of the patrons i, I want to just kind of highlight this real quick um really in-depth well-balanced review with very useful conclusions as an s20 plus user i know that the samsung camera experience is not for me i don't like the colors so not my favorite auto shooter for instagram and i hate how blurry kid shots come out so not my favorite family cam i don't have the time and expertise to dial in my settings in pro mode so that is not a remedy for me personally. It's tough when my only properly supported options are either iPhone or Galaxy. And I think this is one of the most frustrating aspects of the way that other influencers talk about cameras because they've done this humongous disservice to the actual consumer education. 
oh, pro modes. Like, I'm going to sit there and dial in every single little setting on my phone. Well, first of all, if that's your takeaway from using a manual mode on a, on a phone, you can shut up and you can go away. Because that means you're really bad at camera and you're really bad at tech. And so then I get these comments from folks that are genuinely looking for alternatives and they've lacked, they've been pushed out of a consumer conversation, a consumer education conversation. And if I can, if, if I can help that in any way, um, like for example, uh, I don't know if any of you have been following like the crew, Tech King Mike and Gadget Goddess and Barry Johnson and that crew of YouTubers. I really love their live streams. I I, I kind of lurk on their on their streams a lot because they're a lot of fun. But Tech King Mike was is in this love hate relationship with the S twenty one Ultra. The S twenty one Ultra has phenomenally bad shutter lag. I mean, you push the shutter button and you can almost one count one Mississippi before you see the screen pulse to take the photo. And again, I keep saying, use the pro mode, use the pro mode, use the pro mode. Oh, but I can't sit there and dial in all these settings and stuff and control all of my exposure. When you switch to the pro mode, it's still full auto. The camera will decide every exposure setting for you. You don't have to touch a thing but push shutter and get much better photo than what I think Samsung puts out in the auto mode. And because it's not doing so much computational heavy lifting, the shutter response is faster. It's not preloading with all of that HDR nonsense before actually engaging and snapping the photo. It drastically cuts the shutter lag on Samsung phones. But people don't share my videos. I get trashed on our Android and this message doesn't get out there. So instead, you've got this like lowest common denominator, knuckle draggingly stupid approximation of average consumers don't do anything with their settings when this could be a tangible benefit, when it could be a real help. I think the photos look better. I think they look more natural. They're going to be much better archives for your family memories. They work better with filters when you want to juice them up and send them to social media. They're faster to capture. The autofocus works better. And you can also lock in a raw. So it's like having a digital negative if you want that real big, you know, backup image of a precious memory. There's no downside here. It's all good. This is the only way to shoot on Samsung phones. Don't let larger channels and bigger tech influencers convince you that this is hard because nothing could be easier. And then when you get used to the pro mode interface, you can, you can tweak, you can dabble, you can start learning a bit more about how your camera handles that stuff or just lock in the exposure. I think smartphone cameras shoot too bright. Even on my LGs, I almost always set about a third of a stop under just so I've got some headroom on these larger sensors with faster apertures always blowing out my highlights. That's easy. Pro mode is such a gift. And, and we, we, can, we can share that knowledge. We, we, can, we can share that experience. But instead, it's, oh, consumers are dumb and they never edit. I hate it. I hate it so much. Ah, <laughs> uh, Kepper67 subscribed. Uh, oh, subscribed for a while. Hey, happy to support Juan on Twitch and Patreon. Enjoy the content. Keep it up. Hey, I, and I really appreciate that. So again, that was an, a long and extended rant that came off of a comment on the Patreon post for my Galaxy S21 deep dive. And it's not on the person who left the comment. The person who left the comment had a real problem. My family photos come out like garbage when I let Samsung do all this computational junk on my photos. And the fear is that pro mode is going to be too hard. And that that kills me. That's like a knife twist in my gut because it's so much better and I think it's easier and I think you end up with a better final product. You have to deal with a little bit more, you know, highlight clipping. You you have to get familiar with a busier interface, but at, you know, for that little bit of, of work, for that little bit of, of uh, investment, of time, of energy, 
I look at my photos of my daughter growing up and I don't see these gross, dumb HDR photography fads. I've just got these real, these good images, well composed, well exposed. And it was all because I had the right phone at the right time to take the shot or take the video that I really wanted to capture. I don't know, it, it, it bugs. <laughs> Um, otaku, you know, again, I, I, I have this problem because there is no such thing as an average consumer. Hey, and Barry Johnson, Wombat now, what's up, Barry? Um, thanks for dropping, uh, for dropping in, man. I, I appreciate you catching the show. Uh, sorry, uh, otaku, average consumers should just buy iPhones and keep them for five years. That way, maybe they will finally be out of this conversation. I don't believe there is any such thing as an average consumer. I think everyone has specific needs. And if we don't talk about those needs with an actual eye towards fitting the right tool for the right job, then the smartphone market is dead. It's proper dead. Every time I get into a conversation, well, I don't get gaming phones. You don't get more powerful phones that have huge batteries. What's wrong with you? Grow up. There are different product segments and different people have different needs. And Gary the Fireman, Blowing up some tier one subs, hooking up con uh, concept creator uh, Magus Yad, Zazubi, Riviera613, and Lee Zeyong. Uh, Gary, thank you so much, man. That's awesome. Thank you so much for supporting uh, the stream, hooking people up. It's, it's huge, and it's always just a joy um, ca catching these conversations, and, and the support is just phenomenal. So that's going to do us for housekeeping with a mini rant. And I still got done in like 15 minutes. <clears throat> it's great. Oh, and Vazicos 8, the HDR in my Xperia is really nice and natural. And, and there are so many of these flavors. If you fire, I, I think if you fire up a OnePlus 8 Pro, probably not the OnePlus 8T or the OnePlus 8, but you fire up a OnePlus 8 Pro, I think it does a better job of the Samsung camera experience than Samsung does, minus the pro mode for video. I really wish OnePlus would give us pro mode for video. Um, but for photography, for stills, I, I like what they're doing with that weirdly pukey, saturated Samsung look better than what Samsung does. Um, but HDR isn't one thing. HDR doesn't mean all phones need to have this insanely gross, bright color science. And so when you pick up a Sony, it is about dynamic range. It's about maximizing highlight to shadow detail and, and pushing that as far as, it, as they can go. So you, you, if you fire that up for video and you're not playing with their sort of color, um, their color processing modes, that video can look really flat because you're extending the amount of information from highlights to lowlights then you would go in there and throw on a filter or do uh, throw on a LUT or some kind of, of, of color editing or contrast editing. And that's how you arrive at the final image. But you've got more data to work with because the image came out looking kind of dull. That's what we should be looking at. There's someone who's gonna gravitate towards that, probably a tiny minority of the smartphone market. Those people need to know they've got a good solution in there too. Gary the Fireman just tagging one more out the door. Hitting that chatty boy with another gift sub. Thank you, man. That's so great. So uh, let me get this out of the way. Uh, Patreon.com slash some gadget guy. 30 minute camera deep dive Galaxy S21. And I think Samsung's in a weird spot. It's very good. The Galaxy. In fact, I kind of like shooting on the S21 over my last Samsung shooting on the Note 20 Ultra. Um, there's still HDR shutter lag. There's still weirdness inconsistencies in how samsung does their scene optimizer I, i've since they called it bixby i think samsung has been a generation behind for analyzing the scene and editing post-processing that image with all kinds of additions like lg's scene optimization better and faster huawei they were well ahead of the curve on neural processing, core, processing cores uh, to do machine learning, photo editing. I don't get why Samsung keeps getting this de facto um, recognition as the Android camera. Uh, a, a Pixel 5, I think, is way more consistent in its output. It's not always as pukey, vibrant, bright, 
So maybe it's not as good for the Instagrams, but I think the photos come out better. All right, uh, DTNL, can we trust Samsung for cameras? No, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, McCorkerin 3, I wonder how accurately we would be able to predict how all the major big YouTubers will cover the OnePlus 9. Okay, we're going to be talking about a little OnePlus news in uh, in the gadget block, but I, I feel like everyone here should be able to, to sort of predict what's going to go down with OnePlus. It's different than an iPhone. It's different than a Galaxy, so it's not going to be as good. Uh, this this Hasselblad, it's amazing. What an uh, incredible partnership. I took three whole photos with the OnePlus 9 to show you some samples in this photo comparison. And uh, well, I mean, if you're used to Samsung or Apple, I don't know. I think they still have some ways to go. <laughs> I think there is going to be a fair amount of like breathing through teeth. Mm -hmm. Dave Burns, do you think that Samsung's camera is overcompensating for Instagram's red crush and that's why they oversaturate? Um, actually, to be fair, um, and I mentioned this in the camera deep dive, uh, recently we had Trisha Hirschberger on uh, for Best of Our Week. Uh, not last week, but the week before. And TK and I, I well, Trisha is like my sister from another mister. I, I, I absolutely adore getting to tech chat with her and I, we go way too long not, not getting to hang out especially over this last year. Um, she brought up some really fair points because um, she she moves back and forth between uh, an S21 Ultra and a Pixel 5. And she legitimately is one of those people, the way that she shoots social media, would probably be concerned about the thermal throttling on a Pixel 5, like really running that camera hard. It's not difficult to get the phone to run hot if you're shooting high quality video if you're trying to do vlogging if you're trying to do social media posts and and a social media post isn't just one candid little snapshot like for some reason tech influencers act like if you're trying to post something on social media you've got this like one shutter activation and then you're out in the cold and you missed the shot and it's gone forever um, there's a lot that goes into shooting and trying to get a good image to showcase uh, what you're trying to show. So she brought up some great points just about, you know, sort of best practices on Instagram. And if your photos don't stand out, like if they're, if they don't catch the eye in some way, then people scroll right past them. And so if you're doing business on Instagram, or if you're trying to work some kind of influencer or reviewer uh, engagement, you've got to do everything you can to try and lock that attention. So from that perspective, if if the processing on Samsung's camera is all about engaging social media and getting the most likes on your photos, then there's something to it. You know, there is something to Samsung's not so scientific color science. Um, but my main, I don't share photos of my daughter. So as soon as I point my camera at my daughter, I'm, I'm thinking memories, I'm thinking documenting, I'm thinking documentary you know like i want her to be able to see how she grew up and that's for her and that's for us that's for marie and i so i don't want that i don't want these ridiculously over the top uh social media saturated images and and i feel like that's the conflict i feel like that's the main showdown on a samsung camera because i don't think they handle both very gracefully Th there are modes for both but i don't think that's well implemented so that becomes the crux of uh, spoilers that becomes one of the main cruxes of my s21 review oh. <laughs> dtnl uh, one plus nine is a beast of a phone and the hasselblad partnership has significantly improved their performance but <laughs> And Gabaletta, I hate how rainbow pukey the AI processing is for my Note 10 Plus. And the Note 10 Plus is such a solid shooter. Shoot in the pro mode. <laughs> uh, oh, and, and Aditya, again, Tris has some unique perspectives to offer. Um, not exactly tech reviewer, but something a lot more relatable and easier to palette than influencer stuff. Yeah, she kind of, she she's she kind of pivoted a while back. Um, we were doing a lot of tech influencer events. Um, we were working with this great little PR firm 
um, here in Southern California. And uh, we were already friends, but it was like, it was really nice. Like we were just getting to hang out on the regular. And uh, I think she found just a, 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 a nicer, more welcoming community kind of pivoting over to running her, her Twitch channel. And so she still talks tech. She still like shares experiences. Like I think she did a review of the Galaxy S21, but it, it's some of the same conversations. It's just, it's just really frustrating. It's kind of gross. You know, like uh, we had Issa on the week after. Um, we didn't plan it that way, but having two female content creators back to back is definitely insightful for how certain parts of our tech community um, make these conversations much more difficult than they need to be based on the perceived intelligence or uh, contributions of the person doing the influencing, sort of ignoring that different people have different perspectives and different things to share. And, and it, can, it can be frustrating for someone like me, where I want the broadest tech conversation I can get my hands on. <laughs> All right, let, let's let's knock out some news because we, we just extended housekeeping another 10 minutes. <laughs> I'm really bad at that. Uh, okay, so all of the stories, the housekeeping, everything's going to be linked in the show notes for this episode, somegadgetguy.com. Uh, we, we, I want to start off with this. Normally, I would start off with politics because we've got an FCC story. We've got a net neutrality story. Um, but, but I wanted to start off with this one just because I feel this is just another aspect of an ongoing conversation about how governments uh, handle individual businesses and how security concerns are going to continue weighing heavily. Like, I don't see where our current administration is coming back to the table to fairly assess the previous administrations uh, and plural previous administrations not not singular possessive, but plural possessive, uh, handling of companies like ZTE, Huawei, I recently, um, uh, what was the story we, we did last year? DJI, was that, was that one of them? Yeah, anyway. Um, I feel like this is gonna be an interesting play. So this is coming out of CNBC, uh, written up by Arjun Karpal. Huawei to start charging royalties to smartphone makers using patented 5G technology. Um, the company says that it will charge a reasonable percentage. Oh, that's right on CNBC. I don't really highlight or select. Uh, the company said that it will charge a reasonable percentage royalty rate of the handset selling price and a per unit royalty cap at $2.50 for smartphones capable of connections to 5G and previous generations of mobile networks. This price is lower than some of Huawei's competitors, including Finnish telecoms company Nokia. Charging royalties on key patents related to cellular technology could help Huawei make up at least part of the revenue hit in other parts of its business, uh, such as smartphones, as a result of U.S. sanctions. I'm actually kind of surprised they didn't hit this harder. Um, so many of this of these back and forth business moves typically feel punitive. You're doing this, so we're gonna exercise our rights over here. You hit us this hard, we're gonna come back with a dollar amount that that applies some pressure. I'm actually kind of surprised that Huawei wasn't working harder to leverage patents. Um, in, a, in a telecommunications race against Qualcomm, um, where we kind of expect most of the radio tech, like we, we've just gotten into a comfortable holding pattern of radios, modems, antenna design, future wireless technologies. And, and there's, there's sort of an attachment to one brand already that Huawei wasn't already pushing some of this stuff uh, more aggressively. But now I think is kind of the right play. Um, we're seeing a chip shortage in general, which is gonna be a story in the gadget block for Samsung uh, we're already seeing this crunch happen um, in the consumer electronics space, and we're seeing companies scramble to kind of hold on to uh, manufacturing lines that are more profitable. Uh, one of the expectations for why Sony is probably going to slow play the next generation of Xperia. One of the reasons why I think LG has been kind of quiet about follow-up devices on a smartphone division that's been operating at a loss for a while. And I think it's going to be very precious territory for 
the smartphone manufacturers that um, that don't make their own components as much. You know, I, we're, we're looking at gaming phones that are going to be hitting the market, Asus and Red Magic. I'm, I'm curious to see what the next Black Shark is going to do. But if we're in kind of a chip crunch, that's going to be tough. So Huawei is, is kind of getting hit double, right? So with the U.S. sanctions, they don't have access to competitive technologies. There is a general fabrication and chip crunch happening. So it's already difficult for them to, uh, to get their hands on any kind of remaining stock or supply that they would have had access to before. They've got to make up some kind of cash in some way. So this is a, a very smart play. I, I'm going to be very curious to see how this plays out. Because, again, I feel like Huawei will probably get slightly lopsided mainstream media coverage. They're going to start coming after 5G patents. But they should. <laughs> and Raymond, they waited until manufacturers were dependent on their patents. I mean, again, it's not a terrible business model, all things considered. Um, <laughs> I know you're saying it's you, so, so many people here, video arcade, Raymond, it LG V70. I'm, I'm very anxious about LG's position right now. And I don't think, okay. So I've been using the galaxy S 21. I've, I've got to, I've got to send it back to TK. I'm, I'm not going to replace it. I'm, I'm not really going to be too sad to see it go. One of the things that I think is going to be critical is seeing how other manufacturers address the SOC. Um, and and I'm, I'm pretty confident that some of Samsung's cost savings in manufacturing the S21 are contributing to a tier of performance that I think is not up to the Galaxy S mainstream standard. Oh, and TK. Hey, TK. Good morning, everybody. Sorry I'm late to, to the start of the show. TK, I just mentioned how I am going to be getting your Galaxy S21 back to you this week. I haven't texted you that yet, but it's coming. I, I, I apologize for having held on to it for as long as I have. All right. Um, moving right along, we do have to cover some politics. Uh, this is a follow-up to some of the recent consumer protections that have already gone live in California. For example, if you fire up a Samsung and you go into Samsung Pay and you see a disclosure or, or in, if you go into your settings, you'll see how they are talking about your private data and the relationship between Samsung and other businesses that leverage or market that data. The only reason those disclosures exist are because of recent Californian consumer protection laws. So just like Samsung serving ads on your TVs, they now need to disclose when your, when your consumer data, when your private data is being leveraged or monetized. And, you know, it is. <laughs> so there's, there's a new uh, adjunct. That's not the right word. I don't even know that. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, uh, this is directly coming from the attorney general, uh, Javier Becerra, um, announces approval of additional regulations that empower data privacy under the Con California Consumer uh, Privacy Act. So uh, new regulations are, are being attached to the CCPA and, and they're pretty common sensey. Um, oh, I want to get to the quote here. Here we go. Uh, this is from the, the press release. California is at the cutting edge of online privacy protection, and this newest approval by OAL clears even more hurdles in empowering consumers to exercise their rights under the CCPA. These protections ensure that consumers will not be confused or misled when seeking to exercise their data privacy rights. The regulations include an eye-catching privacy options icon that guides consumers to where they can opt out of the sale of their personal information. So basically, we're just mandating like a, a clearer tag. Here's a you, you have to make it a definite big point or icon where a consumer can go to get more informa information on these practices. And, and what I'll be curious to see is how that handles um, some of my issues with Google. Um, when when uh, you fire up map and location data and you say, hey, I really want to see what Google's got on me. And if you go through a phone, you end up in these like lists of links and lists of collections. And it is it is kind of a challenge to navigate through all of that, especially for the very first time, and kind of get to a point where you can see clearly what does Google have on me. It's easier to do from 
you know, like a desktop web browser, but again, most of your interactions are coming from the phone. So it should be a bit clearer and it should be a bit easier to manage from the device that's actually garnering this information. And one of the other um, uh, beefed up regulatory additions to this is also, I, I, I'm curious, to, I, I don't know how you can properly enforce this. Um, if it's like a consumer needs to complain and then an investigation happens or there's some sort of trip for the regulation, but it, it's getting rid of like confusing language about opting out of data collection services. So, you know, like off the top of my head, I don't think anyone would really word it this way, but if you purposely put in double negatives, don't not sell my data, then that would fall afoul of these new uh, uh, additions to the CCPA. So again, I, I don't know how you, how you enforce that, if it has to be uh, like a mass consumer complaint or if you know, some, some other business has to bring it to their, this regulatory body's uh, attention, but it, it's good language to have in a bill about consumer privacy. You can't try to trick someone into giving up their, their private information. So this set the stage for a number of other consumer protection laws. Um, it's gonna guide any kind of federal standard that we might have through the FTC. And companies aren't looking to do business 50 different ways for every state in the United States. Likely California and New York are going to set tough standards and then the rest of the businesses will, call in, will fall in line there. And then that's probably gonna end up being what an FTC is going to do for future consumer protections. <clears throat> Sorry, I got to take a sip here. <laughs> Sorry, a couple comments in there are still 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 catching uh, catching my eye. It sounds like Juan's ready to drive the S twenty one to the airport. <laughs> All right, uh, another. Oh, awesome possum. You're telling me you didn't read the 500 page end user licensing agreement when opening your new smartphone? <laughs> no one does. <sighs> I mean, yeah, it's messy stuff. It it really is. It's a challenge. And and I feel like uh, keep an eye on it. California's consumer privacy laws have already affected positive change in my opinion. I don't see anything here in terms of regulatory practice that's that's dire for businesses or really pushes businesses out of the market. And it's just part of a growing trend where I think people are tired of being the product that's sold. And we need to look at what the next phase of monetization on the Internet is going to look like. Uh, moving right along, we've got some net neutrality news. This FCC is already... Um, getting more aggressive on net neutrality. But Mozilla is leading the conversation. This is CNBC written up by Lauren Feiner. Uh, Tech companies led by Mozilla are urging the FCC to swiftly reinstate net neutrality rules stripped away under the Trump administration. In a letter to FCC Acting Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel on Friday, ADT, Dropbox, Eventbrite, Reddit, Vimeo, and Wikimedia joined Mozilla the maker of the Firefox web browser, in calling net neutrality, quote, critical for preserving the internet as a free and open medium that promotes innovation and spurs economic growth. And then the article goes on to re-explain what net neutrality is and how Ajit Pai, working as a corporate shill, was able to push through an initiative to get rid of it. This is a decades-long battle in the courts and in our legal system and in our lawmakers' halls for crafting the barest minimum consumer protections for how we should interact with corporations and services. And it, it's, it's exhausting. But again, we only need to lose once to backslide over a decade. And that's what Ajit Pai showed us. Again, well, both sides are bad at tech. Yeah, but not really. <laughs> not in the same way. You know, through through Tom Wheeler at the FCC uh, under the Obama administration, we got this underfunded commission to afford us just the minimum of protections, classifying the Internet as a telecommunication service like telephone lines. And that was stripped away uh, under Ajit Pai, under, under the Trump administration. So it's time to start the haul of getting it back. But recently we did see 
again, I'm just props to my state here for all of the, the silly bureaucratic nonsense that Californians have to go through. Occasionally, it means some good stuff, too, uh, where we have properly started implementing net neutrality policy here in California. That's already coming with some corporate gnashing of teeth. Um, especially from companies that supply internet access and then also own media companies so that they can try and stack the deck in terms of their streaming and media options. Well, when you have net neutrality, that means that company either has to handle all media companies the same, um, well, no, that, that's what it means. They have to handle all of these media companies the same, and they can't, pro, uh, they can't deliver preferential treatment to the services that they own. But, of course, that's not how they're going to say it. Um, I'm kind of dancing around this, and I'm being very, very sensitive. But um, AT&T had to put out this press release. This is att.publicpolicy.com, uh, written up by the AT&T blog team impact of California net neutrality law on free data services. Um, this is pretty funny. I, I, I might read this in total. California has enacted a net neutrality law banning sponsored data services that allowed companies to pay for or sponsor the data usage of their customers who are also AT&T wireless customers. Unfortunately, under the California law, we are now prohibited from providing certain data features to consumers free of charge. Prior to California's law, sponsored data customers were able to browse, stream, and enjoy applications from sponsors without using their monthly data al allowance. AT&T video providers utilized sponsored data to offer data-free TV, allowing customers to stream their favorite movies and shows over their AT&T wireless service without it counting against their wireless data plan. AT&T Mobility has for years openly invited any entity to become a wireless data sponsor on the same terms and conditions. Since it began, our sponsored data service and competing offers from other wireless providers have delivered significant benefits and saved co consumers money. Consumers also have enjoyed an explosion of video streaming services. We regret the inconvenience to customers caused by California's new, quote, net neutrality, end quote, law. Again, I, I, I've got to interrupt here just for a second before we finish this out. Net neutrality law. What, why, why are we doing bunny ear air quotes on net neutrality? Capitalize it and then list the actual California law. <laughs> you, can just, you can just say what the name of the law was. Uh, back, back to the uh, press release. Given that the internet does not recognize state borders, the new law not only ends our ability to offer California customers such free data services, but also similarly impacts our customers in states beyond California. See, I told you, California gonna set it. <clears throat> a state-by-state -state approach to net neutrality is unworkable. A patchwork of state regulations, many of them overly restrictive, creates roadblocks to creative and pro-consumer solutions. We have long been committed to the principles of an open internet. We deliver the content and services our customers want because it's what they demand, not because it's mandated by regulation. And we also believe internet access should be available and sustainably affordable to all Americans and strongly advocate for Congress to adopt federal legislation to make that possible while providing clear, consistent, and permanent net neutrality rules for everyone to follow. How many times on this podcast over the last... What now, three years? If you are against a federal net neutrality standard, you are anti business. This is what conservatives should be clamoring for a low level, mostly toothless, highly reactionary federal standard for net neutrality that is only engaged under the most significant transgressions of these corporations. That's what we had with the open internet order. If you allow the wacky states like New York and California to set the standard at the state level, because we also care about states' rights, you're in for a bad business time. Now, that being said, uh, AT&T has been playing this game with sponsored data for years now. I mean, I actually covered, um, while, <laughs> while on the invitation of an AT&T PR rep, um, I actually did cover one of their like developer conferences. 
and they they make it sound like this this wonderful perk, this great benefit. But that's exactly the kind of of uh, corporate um, manipulation that we should be very sensitive to. It looks great for the end user. Oh, I want to stream on this video platform, and I don't have to pay extra. I don't use any more of my data. First of all, why are we still treating data like buckets of, of a quantity? It, it, there's no good information or good scientific research that we've shown that this impacts consumer usage and that if they're not beefing up their network to handle the load of new services, then they're not doing their job as ISPs and carriers. Back to this main point, there is a chilling effect in competition when there is a rate established, which isn't very easy to untangle. It's not easy to figure out what are these terms and conditions unless you're going to them to make this pitch and to, and to apply for, for this, type of, uh, this, this type of use. But let's say you're a small upstart. Let, let's say, or a startup. Um, let, let's say you're trying to push some type of new service, new application, could be something you know, like, a, a, we'll just throw in like a clubhouse, right? That is a, a data feed, a streaming service. Whether or not they've got the backing of investors to really pour money into making sure that people can always utilize that service, why would someone go and use clubhouse on their mobile data if clubhouse can't afford to pay AT&T for sponsored data it does create a second tier of internet, but at the developer side, you know, at the, at the services side, that has a chilling effect on competition. That's bad for competition. And that's only with AT&T. So if one of those companies wants to also leverage something for a T-Mobile, you know, try to do business with a Verizon, looking at all of the various MVNOs for, for, uh, you know, for, for some type of partnership or collaboration, They've got to go carrier by carrier to try and reach those individual consumers. When really we're well past this point at the consumer level, at the consumer standard, where we should be this precious about handling data. You, our, our networks should be able to handle more robust use. Um, we should be able to treat all, all of this content the same, which is what neutrality is going to force them to do. So it, it, largely, I agree, we're well over, overdue some type of federal net neutrality standard. It's not good for companies to try and handle this state by state. Um, <laughs> it's just galling because the telecommunications industry has worked so aggressively to, uh, to wreck the work that we've put into making a federal standard. And now they're going to have to deal with the fact that the states are taking it up on their own. Um, yeah, I, I, I've, I've been on a couple other shows and interviews, and, and one was a little bit more libertarian leaning. And the reality of this, while we would love to have some kind of free market solution, that's just as unicorn utopian as like Star Trek's version of communism in the 24th century. Um, the reality of actually dealing with this in the in the modern age in, in this present day is is very intricately balanced between all of these different initiatives and all of these different regulations. So again, I I I, I feel for AT and T customers who won't fully understand why certain services are now counting against their plans. But this is also an opportunity for AT and T to step up and make it clear what products and services are going to be a better fit for their consumers. Maybe maybe come up with a better uh, website portal. Hey, your usage is really heavily focused on this type of, of video streaming. Maybe you should consider these other these other plans and programs to, to make sure, you know, your your data hits your, your data needs are better met after, you know, we have to shift our business model because of California regulations. Make it a benefit. Make it a way to improve those programs and services. Oh, write your politicians because California net neutrality is such a meanie. Mm. <laughs> uh, so Dave Burns, T-Mobile did very similar things too, but what, what I'll be curious to see, what I'll be very curious to see is how T-Mobile handles relationships and partnerships like... Uh, like don't don't you get free not free but you pay for it in your in your plan but don't they attach uh, Netflix 
Well, T-Mobile doesn't own Netflix, and I don't believe that Netflix is paying T-Mobile. I don't know how that business relationship goes down. So that's, that's I think, going to be the next thing to keep, keep an eye on. How do infrastructure services like cell phone carriers do business with individual media streaming services? So the internet should be classified as a telecommunications service. How does a telecommunications operator like T-Mobile do business with an information service like Netflix or YouTube? And that's going to be tricky. We're, we're in yet another gray area, thanks to Ajit Pai. Now we don't know again. That causes marketplace confusion. That's bad for consumers. And ultimately, that's bad for every business that does business on the internet, all because of that smug corporate shell, Ajit Pai and his ridiculously oversized Reese's Pieces peanut butter cup coffee mug. Uh, Gary the Fireman, Netflix on us. So... I feel there has to be some type of prorate where T-Mobile uses funds from your monthly subscription to pay Netflix for an attach rate. That's what I think is probably going down, not the other way around, where on AT&T, it's Netflix has to pay AT&T to not be included in the bucket of data that AT&T subscribers buy every month. And this stuff is going to get messier and way more confusing. All right, we got one more uh, quick news story. Again, this is more just a follow-up and to keep an eye on what's going on. Um, recently, Apple has been very delicately trying to navigate the uh, regulation investigations into App Store policy. Um, on, on the one hand, you've got Tim Cook saying all developers are, are treated the same, but then immediately having to backtrack on that and saying, but there are rules for how we can treat different developers in different ways. They're currently still in the middle of a lawsuit against Epic, um, the makers of Fortnite, for how their app store takes a certain percentage of every sale. And I feel like that's probably different for a software development company than it might be for, say, uh, Amazon. So if you go and install Amazon on your iPhone, do we think that Apple takes 30% of every sale through Amazon? Or are there different criteria for how you do business with you know, a company that sells things on the internet in one way versus a company that sells things on, an inter on the internet in a different way? That's also getting rolled into the regional laws of everywhere that Apple does business. And uh, we, we kind of mentioned it briefly, but I didn't really focus on it as a, as a, as a story because I didn't know enough about it. And I'm still reading into it. So pardon that this is also going to be a little shallow from me, but I hope you'll read through this story on Ars Technica because Apple's going to have to change up some of their privacy and uh, security conversations in other regions. Here in the United States, they're gung-ho, Apple is going to protect you, Apple's going to lock all this down, Apple, 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 privacy, privacy, privacy. But what about China? And more recently, what about Russia? Uh, this is written up by Lily Hay Newman of Wired.com, but published on Ars Technica. Apple bent its rules for Russia, and other countries will take note. Beginning in April, new iPhones and other iOS devices sold in Russia will include an extra setup step. Alongside questions about language preference and whether to enable Siri, users will see a screen that prompts them to install a list of apps from Russian developers. It's not just a regional peculiarity. It's a concession Apple has made to legal pressure from Moscow, one that could have implications far beyond Russia's borders. Quote, this comes within the context of years and years of mounting regulatory pressure on tech companies, uh, says Adrian Shabazz, Director of Democracy and Technology at the human rights nonprofit Freedom House. Uh, the country has undertaken a massive effort to reshape its internet toward mechanisms for control, censorship, and mass surveillance. And the government has imposed increasingly strict regulations on domestic tech companies. Quote, they must store data on local servers, provide security agencies with decryption keys, and remove content that violates Russian law, uh, Shabazz says. 
though not all companies do all of those things, quote, and now they're being forced to promote government approved apps on their platforms. So we're seeing Russia uh, sort of crank the pressure on corporations like Apple who want to do business with with Russian consumers. At the same time that we're also seeing a Chinese initiative where they're going to create a framework of monitoring and advertising that is somehow going to exist outside of Apple's consumer protections. So there's this back and forth at play. I, Apple can still make a claim, hey, we care about your privacy. But if you engage with these other services on any kind of smartphone device, they're able to circumvent Apple's protections. Were you to do that in the United States, I feel Apple would make a good faith effort in trying to rein in those apps and services. They would fall afoul of Apple's terms of service. You are trying to do something to circumvent our security policy. We're going to move, remove your app from the App Store. I'm curious to see if that's the kind of policy Apple's going to adopt if a consortium of Chinese developers are all working together on some type of outside standard for monitoring and for uh, consumer advertising. Because then if Apple has to say no Chinese apps, then there's no point in buying an iPhone in China. If Apple says on the iPhone, we protect your privacy, but you have to use these Chinese services, well, that's not us. Then it kind of kind of betrays the marketing you know the you know, apple cares about this but we're not we're just going to turn a blind eye towards you know systems that track you outside of of our core smartphone operating system and then even worse still to be able to continue doing business in russia means purposely on the iphone circumventing their own claims of privacy and consumer protections by having a splash screen at startup that that enables this type of uh, Russian monitoring. This stuff is going to get real messy. I'm, I'm turning to more towards the EU um, to, to kind of see where our future for consumer privacy is going to go. Um, but they're going to be facing intense pressure um, especially with Russia jumping into this type of, of uh, manipulation um, uh, of manufacturers and smartphones. And uh, like I said, I am, I am barely scratching the surface on the ramifications of this globally as a sort of a business concern long term. So again, I would highly recommend catching up on some of the recent stories regarding uh, Chinese software developers uh, trying to find other advertising methodologies around um, Apple's uh, protections. And then this story from Ars Technica is kind of a big deal. We were just talking about AT&T complaining about California net neutrality influencing the whole of the country. Russia's policy on forcing Apple, again, that couldn't happen in Canada. Canada could not force Apple to include a bunch of apps on the iPhone. Like it just wouldn't it just wouldn't be a thing. So now that Russia has enabled this, what about every other uh, government on the planet that wants to have some kind of hook or or insight into their citizens' uh, smartphone use? Now, even here in the United States, I'm sure there are some three-letter agencies that would be very interested in getting a, a deeper or more granular look at how people utilize their, their electronics. <laughs> Gabaletta, you're safe if you only use our services and apps and you don't connect to the internet and you don't share any information on the internet and you don't you don't use any cloud. <laughs> I, I mean, again, I, I, I find it frustrating. Um, I, I think Apple does make a good faith effort to try and afford consumers better information on how their data is leveraged and utilized. But increasingly, iOS isn't more secure. In fact, you know, I still don't believe I, I don't believe that you know, the the researchers that pay for exploits have started paying for iOS exploits any again. Like iOS is not that difficult to compromise uh, based on consumer behavior. 
And then as soon as you connect to anything and you use any service, you're giving that data up. So I, I really respect their ability to start um, front loading opt in policies rather than forcing consumers to look through settings for an opt out. That's a that's a great step in the right direction. But but this notion that I have an iPhone, so I'm protected and my Macs don't get viruses is so early 2000s. This n landscape that we're in today is so much more complicated. It's so much more nuanced. <laughs> Uh, see, Nam, I mean, again, it's a step in the right direction. That's why I'm using Facebook in, in my uh, mobile with Chrome. Um, the few times a year I actually manually check into my Facebook account and look at any of the activity there, um, it, it's through Firefox with their custom Facebook container. <laughs> so it tries to lock Facebook into this perfect little box of not letting it spread all out uh, over the rest of my browser, which is super gross. And Heiki made it back. Heiki finally made it back. All right. Um, mm -mm -mm. From May Mondit, what about using a VPN? Will the forced apps report you? I, I, I would imagine that there is probably an active cat and mouse game happening. Um, you know, I, I was using a VPN years back when I when I made my last trip out to Shenzhen just so that I can engage with like the services that I really do need to use to get my work done. Um, I believe that that great firewall has probably shifted in being able to better track what data is coming in and out um, of all these various services. I don't think it's ever as easy as install this VPN, go to work, do whatever you want to do. I think it's more as one exploit is discovered or as one method of tracking is is defeated, something else replaces it. So uh, again, it, it's a consumer behavior, buyer beware. Be careful with what you do online and, and try your best to uh, use, to adopt uh, good internet um, behaviors. And that's the best we can do right now. Um, we're, we're in for... A pretty rough fight, I think. Um, you know, Google is looking at what the next phase of their advertising business is going to look like. Facebook is going to be forced to pivot, and they're gonna, not going to go quiet because they've had easy cash by making a leaky service for so long. And now individual regional governments are also going to be weighing in on who can do business and how they should be able to do business. We should keep an eye on this. We should keep a closer eye on this than, you know, like what passes for cable news these days. All right. Um, we, uh, we're finally through the news block. I, I'm, I'm very proud of myself. We got through the news block in like, what was that? I mean, just like a, a little over uh, 30 minutes, like 35 minutes, um, considering how rambly I went through housekeeping again. Um, I feel like this is the right time. Just take a quick stretch, quick break. I get some water and uh, we got to talk about the subreddit. I'm so excited by what hit the top of the subreddit this week. Uh, just such a sweet story. Um, so stoked for, for the people involved. And uh, again, just in making our tech community feel, feel like a community, this wasn't something that even blipped on my smashed bell icon YouTube feed. I never saw it on YouTube. So every podcast has a subreddit. My podcast is no exception. Reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles. From last week to this week, we finally ticked over. So we're at 1,665 subscribers. And that pushes us, that nudges us over to rounding up. So now we show 1.7 thousand members. <laughs> on the little subreddit that could. Um, the submissions have been amazing over the last couple of weeks. Um, and, and I think to uh, to Matt Tyler's credit, um, he's gonna be very excited that my face isn't occupying the top three positions on the subreddit. A number one, I am so excited to share some good news from one of my favorite techies Erica Griffin has a mini tech nerd on the way. She posted a little video 
announcing that her and her husband are expecting i couldn't be happier for her this is huge this is just joyous happy news and uh, definitely something that just across the board we techies we nerds um we, we can all sort of shoot her a thumbs up some kind of message of congratulations this is adorable and I, I I couldn't be happier for them. So again, congratulations, Erica Griffin. Um, I, I, and and I, I I'm fairly confident that she's probably, especially given her recent YouTube activity, is probably going to be a bit more conservative in sharing all of her, you know, sort of baby experiences. But there's also a part of me that hopes she does share some of her thoughts on like parent tech. I was really considering like when when Lex was a baby talking a bit more about some of the lifestyle and uh, gadgets and, and experiences that we had with like nanny cams and webcams and audio products and, and like this whole market of some really, I, I'm trying to be careful in, 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 in how I phrase this, but you know, like there are some sort of fear based products and like trying to scare you into taking care of your kids in a certain way. And, and it, it can be kind of, it can be kind of difficult to untangle like actual manufacturer claims and then you go and try and find reviews on baby tech and like it's a wasteland you know it's basically just someone writing up a press release and putting in an affiliate link so if anyone is going to share thoughts on baby tech and kid tech that i would respect it would be someone like erica griffin <laughs> uh moving right along i mean again we the submissions were on point this week Gary explains in the number two spot comparing NTFS versus FAT32 versus XFAT. We've got Adam Reviews Tech with 2,200 subscribers chatting out the Xbox Series S. We've got Tech Odyssey with 45,000 uh, 45, subscribers looking at the Galaxy Tab S7. Tim Schofield. Now, he's, this is a bigger challenge, but he had a video on Motorola's Ready 4, which is a terrible name for an exciting new feature on the Motorola Edge Plus, which is their new desktop mode. Motorola, the company that kind of kicked off some of those early experiments and turning your phone into some type of laptop competitor, finally coming back to show us a desktop mode. This should have happened on the Moto Z Force, right? You know, Moto Mods, it still, still drives me crazy that Motorola did not use Moto Mods to make a laptop dock. But I digress. Uh, Tim Schofield giving us the scoop on his early experiences setting it up. Uh, my video from reviews.org talking about Wi-Fi. And rounding out the, the top stories, we've got TK Bay checking out the Rode Wireless Go 2, some little teeny tiny portable wireless microphones that I absolutely adore. And just uh, kind of run down the list. We've got, uh, technically speaking, we got Scott Peachy checking out the Pixel 5, um, which isn't too much of a surprise, right? Because, you know, he's the Pixel guy. <laughs> We've got a Galaxy A72 look from Gadget Byte. We've got scary, if literal, uh, Shane Craig checking uh, Surface Duo versus Z Fold 2, looking at uh, productivity. Uh, we've got my buddy Steve Litchfield. Just a, this is an interesting conversation from Steve talking about value, the value of your smartphone, and something that I think also kind of gets wrapped up in a lot of fud when people are buying new phones. Uh, we've got some uh, the Devoom, Divoom, Devoom, Planet Nine. Uh, last week's podcast did pretty well in sort of the the top fifteen. And uh, I wanted to wrap it out. Mobile tech review. We've got Lisa talking about the ThinkPad X12 which is a detachable tablet laptop product, very Surface style, um, but Lenovo's hardware is just so much fun uh, to, to play with. This week on the subreddit, I mean, the last couple weeks on the subreddit have been phenomenal. This week was really great. It was really fun to see not only a diversity of like consumer electronics, smartphones and computers, some of the techier stuff like talking about file formatting on large storage, but then also just some personal stuff to share too. So I, I just, I couldn't have been more pleased catching all of the traffic from reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles. Ah, it was really good, really good week, really strong. So catch us up Reddit. Keep sharing. We're getting great submissions across the board, but then also don't be stingy with those upvotes. We're starting to see more double digit um, upvotes. 
you know, posts that are starting to hit 10, 20 uh, individual upvotes, that kind of momentum really does help a content creator out. Say someone's got like a thousand subscribers and they get bumped to the top of a subreddit, they're far more likely to get picked up in search and then also shared on larger subreddits where appropriate. So sharing throughout the various communities, cross posting where, you know, follow the other subreddits rules, but where appropriate, this stuff can be huge for someone to start growing or blowing up a channel. Reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles. And every week I get to do this rundown. It gives me a little more hope for humanity. And we can find ways around terrible algorithms getting in the way of the content that we want to watch. Um, so speaking of watch, ing content, how about content about a watch? I'm amazing at segues. I can't believe I pulled off the landing on that. Whew. It's almost like I, uh, I uh, it's almost like I host a weekly show or something. <laughs> Banter. So um, lo lots of places have, have sort of been showing off the OnePlus watch. Um, I have some thoughts, but you know, front loading this before I, I cut to the story. OnePlus not using Wear OS. What are your thoughts? on a OnePlus watch. What do you expect is going to be the hook? More fitness trackery? Are they going to try and compete on Apple Watch style applets and services? Does this mean a whole new ecosystem of applets? Support for non OnePlus phones? What do you think? This is, this is an interesting pivot from OnePlus to not use Wear OS. So, um, here, let me get this out of the way here. <laughs> DTO, Juan is the only dude who can rival Linus's cringy segues. Uh, same cringy segues, less dropping of GPUs. Uh, we'll, we'll make that promise on my channel. Maybe I'll put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> All right. Um, OnePlus watch revealed ahead of the 9 Series event. We're expecting a big old event tomorrow. This is written up by Chris Holt at Engadget. Uh, OnePlus will officially unveil its first smartwatch next week, but via Unbox Therapy, the company has offered a sneak peek. At first glance, the OnePlus watch doesn't have a terribly exciting design. Circular face and at least two side buttons. The colored lines on the screen call to mind Apple, Apple Watch's activity rings. CEO Pete Lau said the OnePlus watch includes a premium material never before seen in a smartwatch. And the company is promising seamless connectivity between the device and other OnePlus products at, quote, an affordable price point. It seems the OnePlus watch won't run on Wear OS. OnePlus has opted for a smart wear operating system developed based on RTOS, according to Lau. And the event is going to kick off March 23rd. That's tomorrow from the recording time of this podcast. I am not well versed on what an RTOS is, other than it's called a real-time operating system. So I'm not sure why in their sort of marketing discussions or in their sort of preview discussions, why that became as much of a focus um, to, 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 to talk about, other than to say that this is not going to be um, a Wear OS product. You know, like they wanted to, to make a point out of saying this is going to exist in a different software ecosystem. You know, what's kind of funny to me is when people like criticize, well, I mean, the design isn't terribly exciting. It's got two buttons and it's got a round screen. It's like every watch, right? It, it does look a little more gadgety. It's got that kind of simple round look. It, you know, again, if you look at um, the Amazfit, I just reviewed the GTR2E. It looks like you could have taken the casing from that Amaze Fit and just rounded off the buttons so that they were more flush with the casing, uh, the side of the casing. And that's what the uh, the OnePlus watch is going to look like. And, and yes, I mean, like, uh, you know, I've got my tick watch on right now. Um, I, I've just been loving uh, this tick watch. And, and it's got a little bit more of that, that raised uh, beveled bezel, uh, which has, like, the little markings, like more of a traditional man uh, male uh, timepiece and that makes it look a little a little more watch like in some type of more sporty or uh bolder watch face uh kind of design i, I don't I, I i don't know what folks are are trying to accomplish by saying well it's, it just looks so plain 
yeah, simple is clean. You know, there's a reason why Apple really hasn't changed the look of the Apple Watch ever <laughs> since launching it. So you want it to be kind of discreet, but identifiable. Simple, but then able to better complement someone's personal style. Um, if you if you make it too bold or catchy or, or flashy, I think you're going to have a, a harder time. A harder time with that product as it ages you know it's going to be a product of its time and it's not going to be timeless so i i don't have any complaints with this look i i don't love the design they're going with the watch strap but that's also one of the things that i, I almost immediately replace anyway it's kind of like putting a case on a phone well, i don't well, i don't know about this design or the phone is just so exciting a design and then you put a case on it um same thing with watch straps um personalize it you know that that's that's not the issue so I, I, I kind of want to get into, dig into a bit of these, but um, uh, do, 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 do. So some of the comments coming back from Gabaletta, I think they are going with a more fitness end than just another smart thing on your wrist. Um, and I think that would be the immediate, um, I, like the immediate impression would be it's not wear, running Wear OS. It's obviously not going to compete with, you know, going to play with something like Tizen or some other watch operating system. So the easiest thing to do is to make it more fitness focused. But I would be curious to see if there is some kind of pass through making watch interactions smarter. If you could tie the watch better through uh, a voice assistant. That, that could be a good perk for making the watch smarter than just a regular fitness tracker, but not adding a ton of stuff that requires developers to do a whole bunch of, of uh, coding to get their applets and services on this watch. And that, to me, I think is, is one of the areas where fitness trackers have kind of fallen behind. Like the Amazfit has all of these proprietary voice actions and voice controls. They don't work in any way that you are familiar with your your smartphone's voice assistant so you've got to like learn and memorize specific voice interactions just for that wearable and then if you switch it those probably won't work with any other product so if if we can get a fitness tracker with just a simple pass through directly to your assistant and better support for rich notifications then i think oneplus is well ahead of the curve you don't need all of those little applets and services if you've got that kind of heartbeat, that that pulse going back and forth between the watch and the phone. But Dave Burns, you know, I don't care about applets and Wear OS is a battery hog. <laughs> I don't know that Wear OS is really that bad. I really feel Wear OS is hamstrung by, you know, especially if you were on the Snapdragon uh, 2100 and 3100, those were underpowered SOCs. So operating the watch meant that those little chips were cranking uh, often they didn't have enough RAM. So especially if you were under a gig of RAM on those uh, 2100s and 3100s, the watch performed like, um, uh, the watch performed very poorly. Again, I'm, I'm wanting to swear so much on this podcast this week. Um, and a watch screen, I think is still the biggest hit to battery life. Um, even Apple, you know, they're, they're like, hey, we can change the, the dy dynamic refresh rate of this watch screen. Still, you got to charge the, the the watch in under 24 hour time periods, right? It can't even go a full 24 hours if you're really using it. So then you pick up something like a tick watch, which uses an ultra low power display, is on the Snapdragon 4100, has enough RAM, and I can easily go three days, sometimes three days and three nights on a single charge. So I don't think it's Wear OS. Now, Wear OS versus a fitness tracker, yeah, a fitness tracker can go a week. That Amaze Fit blew me away for battery life. But as soon as I want to reply to a text message, I can't use it. <laughs> uh, Fat Produce says he's glad this isn't running Wear OS. Uh, Squishy Man, 2007. I'm a bit surprised OnePlus isn't using Wear OS because of oxygen being so close to stock. I guess I figured if that their watch would just use Wear OS. I think a lot of us were expecting, especially with Samsung going back to Wear OS. I really felt like OnePlus is in a position where they're, I think they're keeping their sights on Samsung as one of their top competitive goals. 
And if Samsung is going back to Wear OS, I kind of expected they would too. So, eh? but apparently not. <laughs> Simon says, Hypno, I want a hexagonal watch with seven buttons. <laughs> what? But why a hexagon? Because then you'd have to have two buttons on one side. You, what you want is a hexagonal watch with six individual buttons and then the ability to Apple style force press into the screen. Or even better, if you make it like, uh, what was the BlackBerry? What was the BlackBerry that actually had a click when you pushed into the screen and Pocket Lint could like get under that and, and disable your click? Was that the torch? I can't remember. What you want is a click button. So hexagonal, a button on each side, and then a, a, a down press button. So that there, there, that's how you get to seven buttons on a hexagon. <laughs> <laughs> Dave Burns, uh, quote, I need a controversial opinion to make people angry and therefore engage with my content. So let's call it boring. <laughs> yuck, 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 yuck. Simon says, Hypno, quote, it's not groundbreaking in design like an Apple Watch. <laughs> or, or sorry, a Sam Apple Watch. Because um, I, I, I still feel, was it the Gear S2? I think it was the Gear S2 is still one of my favorite Gear smartwatches. The original Gear S I wish we could get back to one of those chunky boys. You know, I should pull that out. I think I still have a Gear S. It's the one that looks like a mini phone. So the joke I made when I reviewed the Samsung Gear S, because it was like a curved OLED, and it was it was like a big rectangle. It was, it was this bold thing that lived on your wrist. Um, <laughs> if that still works, I, I could go back to that. But the thing that that lit me up and, and it, it just tickled the idea, like I so desperately wished that time travel were a thing. Like, what if you took a Gear S back to that transition point, like the first iPhone is coming out, but the consumer trend was smaller and smaller and smaller cell phones. Like you remember Zoolander talking about these teeny tiny little phones that you could accidentally swallow, right? And you go back in time and you're like, yeah, I'm from the future. You're still using one of those giant iPhones. This is what phones look like in the year 2020. And you, know, and you just you just hold up like the Gear S, but outside of its watch strap. Because it even had like teeny little keyboard. It was this just adorable little rectangle of, of a smartwatch. I just, I, I, I should have done like a sketch, you know, just like people lying in time travel would have been hilarious. Ah, I want that so bad. <laughs> Gary the Fireman likes his analog watches with real gears, balance wheels, and springs. I've got some nice timepieces. I mean, nothing super, super expensive or fancy, but like even my old Scoggin. And I've got a Scoggin hybrid. I've talked about that before. I don't need to go down that one, that, that one again. From Loco Rudy. I need notifications and fitness tracking, not because I'm fit, but because I want to feel not so unhealthy. <laughs> yeah, oh, I know that feel. I, I am well familiar with that feel. Uh, I'm wrapping up. I shot all the B-roll for the Mobvoi treadmill, which is surprisingly good. Uh, it's like a $400 collapsible treadmill that can like slide under a couch. Um, and it's not... It's not what I would use if you were really like distance training or you were trying to do hills and stuff like that. But to have something immediately accessible where you just want to get your step count up is really good. So TK did a full review on it. I'm, I'm going to have a video out on mine very soon, but I think I'm going to actually make it a part of a fitness challenge where if anyone wants to join me, we can maybe set up some way of like sharing Google Fit data or something like that. We can all kind of kick our own butts about uh, trying to stay on top of our basic step count and fitness requirements. Oh, and Gabaletta says that they think the OnePlus watch is going to go with a $199 price tag. That's been the other thing that's been um, the big guess. I mean, we're going to find out tomorrow, right? The event's March 23rd. Uh, they're they're going to take the wraps officially off the OnePlus 9. Um I, I, I'm, I'm wondering if there are going to be any surprises, but pricing is going to be very critical uh, for these OnePlus phones and um, this OnePlus watch, where rumors, I believe rumors are putting the OnePlus watch somewhere around 150 euro, because that's the other thing I, I think will be the surprise. 
what regions are going to be getting which devices. So we're pretty confident we'll see a trio of one plus nines, sort of small, medium, large, right? But I don't think all three are going to come to the United States and that later in the year, we're going to get a Nord follow-up for some of the MVNO and lower cost carriers where the Nord N10 was a very surprising, um, a, a very positively surprising low cost smartphone. I really like what that phone offers at 299 I kind of feel we'll see OnePlus 9, I mean, sorry, OnePlus Watch somewhere around 150 bucks. That's that's my guess. Um, not so cheap that it's a, that, that it's like an Insta buy or just like a casual purchase or something like that, but not so expensive that it's squarely in the sights of a more feature rich uh, you know, a, a Galaxy watch. <clears throat> or, or against like you know the new Tick Watch and the new Tick Watch S, which is uh, better water resistance. So I, I kind of feel somewhere in that 150, 149.99. For some reason, that makes a lot of sense in my head, but I don't think it's going to launch immediately in the United States. I think they're going to target EU and India hard. I think that's going to be the main push for OnePlus moving forward, and then United States and Canada are going to be tier two. We're, we're going to be sort of the follow-up um, where uh, our carrier agreements kind of get in the way of how OnePlus might be doing business. <laughs> this is not the Howard Stern show. Um... <laughs> oh, Loki Ted. I think it was the BlackBerry Storm. The, to the Torch was a slider phone. I think you're right. I can't remember some of those. I, I wasn't so into BlackBerry with the BlackBerry OS 10 devices with the exception of the Passport. The Passport was my jam, but I never really messed with, you know, clicky screen. And I wish I had. Um, Dave Burns, let's do it. I will destroy you. <laughs> it won't be hard. I'm having a difficult time just meeting my basic step rings. <laughs> what, 5,000 steps a day? Who has time for 5,000 steps a day? And King Turtle is saying, my prediction will be $700 for the OnePlus 9 and $1,000 for the 9 Pro. I think, I think we could see a OnePlus 9, because what? The OnePlus 8T is a $750 phone with 256 gigabytes of storage. And they're going hard on cameras. So I think it benefits OnePlus. I would say maybe a OnePlus... 9R or whatever their light model, maybe that starts at $699. The OnePlus 9 starts at $799. And then the OnePlus 9 Pro starts at $899. And I actually, I said this on Daniel Bader on the AC uh, podcast, how cool it would be if there were just $100 increments. Sort of something that competes against the S21 at $699, then $799, then $899. And then another tier for in, in increasing storage and maybe it's 50 bucks for doubling the storage or something like that i kind of feel like that ballpark makes sense so i'll be really curious to see if a oneplus 9 competes better feature for feature against an s21 where the s21 whittles back on a lot <laughs> of the uh um whittles back on a lot of the extra features that we used to take for granted on a Samsung. Um, from ER1980, the OnePlus 9R, from what I hear, is for the India market only and will be priced even lower than $699. Totally possible. Definitely possible. But again, I kind of feel like a OnePlus 9 is really going to compete against an S21 Plus, not an S21 or an S20 FE. So we'll have to see. Um, I'll be, you know, again, Samsung undercut so aggressively walmart style that now everyone's good but you can start on a samsung at like six hundred dollars you're like yeah but it's a six hundred dollar phone <laughs> ah. and sentinel 909 says he's pretty sure the pro is going to be over a thousand dollars so uh piggybacking on some of this conversation because we were talking about samsung um real quick you know, I put out a video sort of end of last year, throwing my hat into the ring to guess that the Note series was not going to happen anymore. Um, we're getting some confusing word back from Samsung that Note might happen, 
Note might happen next year. Note could live on in other products like the S21 Ultra and the Fold 3. We're, we're not entirely sure what's going to happen to the Note. But this is coming from Yon Hap News Agency. I've got a translation of it here, and I'm going to be linking that translation So uh, for, for the show notes. Um, Samsung Electronic Company's mobile business chief said Wednesday that the world's largest smartphone maker would not discard its Galaxy Note smartphone series, although new models may not be released this year. Um, from, from DJ Co., it can be a lot of pressure on us to release two... Oh, come on. There we go. It can be a lot of pressure on us to release two flagship models supporting the S Pen within a year, so the launch of new Galaxy Note series may not happen in the second half of this year. And this was said at Samsung's annual shareholder meeting um, uh, south of Seoul, Korea. Next year, the launch period of the Galaxy Note may be different than the past, but we are trying to continue the series. The Galaxy Note series is an important category for us. Um, then later asked about the supply and shortage of chips um, for the smartphone and the automobile industry. Um, I cannot say that we have solved this problem 100% at the moment. We could face issues in the second quarter, but everyone is working hard to solve the problem. So Samsung is pushed back against the idea that it's this chip crunch that is affecting the note, um, that they're not directly related. But I feel that there is a holistic view of putting out products mentioned specifically is a phone like the Galaxy S21, which has support for a stylus. And then how do you position that against a Galaxy S with a Note when the major differences are a smaller battery and a, a built-in stylus silo? And that's a challenge. Um, it's, it's one that I, I kind of wish Samsung weren't so precious with their S Pen technology and instead were a bit more like LG, where... A Velvet, um, actually the Stylo 6 technically does support the Wacom Active Pen. I mean, the digitizer seems to be in there even if the software doesn't fully recognize all of the features of, of the pen. But the Velvet, the Wing, the V60, they all have stylus support. And at some point I feel like we're missing out on a consumer productivity conversation by not including stylus support on uh, the A series. A Galaxy A90 or even a Galaxy A70 with stylus support would be a great addition to this lineup, bringing those features to more accessible price points. And we've got plenty of horsepower. Anyone who's worried about, oh, but what about my business and productivity needs on a an, on an, uh, Snapdragon 700 series? Eh, you're fine. <laughs> you're good. Eh, you can you can open documents and sketch and do all those same things. It's It's like having a... Uh, a, a Snapdragon 845 again, which you're probably not maxing out. So I, I feel like these are these are both true, while also I think Samsung is probably going to be playing part of this year more conservative. They just cut prices on the Galaxy S while pivoting to release less phone than the Galaxy S last year. The big premier marquee expensive phones are not sold in the units and quantities that really make up the core bread and butter, the, 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 the profitability of their smartphone business. And a note, I feel, complicates that premium tier conversation where I feel in the second half of this year, they're really going to want people focused on the fold. They're not going to want to confuse the market with a $1,500 single screen stylus phone against a $2,000 mini tablet that folds up. So I, I kind of feel like if, if there's already a chip crunch, they're already having difficulty like fulfilling all of that demand. It just makes a lot of sense this year to sit the note out. And then depending on how the sales go, you know, selling the stylus as a separate accessory is better for profitability, right? Um, you, you sell a case and a stylus on top of a $1,000 plus phone that looks better than selling it all in one package. And this is Samsung following Apple's lead. Why, why put everything in the box when you can make consumers buy all of this stuff piecemeal? And then it's better, right? You know, you spend just as much on the phone 
And then you also need to buy all of these accessories. And then you've got the same experience that you used to have. And Samsung makes more money. <laughs> ah, from Dave Burns. <clears throat> Ooh, my vo voice just went really fuzzy. I think what annoys me is that if Samsung chose to use an open source stylus implementation or open source S Pen, they would be criticized for not being as tightly integrated as Apple and the fanboys circle yank themselves into a frenzy over it. I, I, I gotta say, minus the, the fun wireless features, like having Bluetooth implementation on a stylus so that I can control a remote shutter, which I do on my watch from time to time, it's handy. Being able to pick up a PC stylus and go right to my V60 or my wing is really super handy. It is, it is kind of nice having sort of a more open implementation or an open pro protocol that works back and forth. In fact, it's a little bit annoying on my Surface that it doesn't properly support an, a, a more accessible open pen standard that so many PC manufacturers are using. Um, so, so, I mean, again, it, I'm, I'm looking at Samsung and saying, like, they're, they're very reasonable explanations for why you would want to sit the note out. Um, but, but I feel like this is going to be a pivot towards bringing note technologies to the most expensive products in Samsung's catalog at the expense of the actual note label, the actual note brand. I think that's the play is I think Samsung will make more money that way. <laughs> From Loco Rudy. Uh, my Note 4 was a superior phone for the three and a half years I had it, then went to the Nexus 6P, felt good about the minimalistic feel, went back to the Note 8, was not thrilled. Since then, I feel they haven't done much to differentiate it from other phones to justify the price. I think it pushes more to the extremes. If you really heavily use the stylus, the Note makes a lot of sense. If you're kind of a part-time stylus user like I am, just having an extra stick, I keep a pen in my pocket, you know, like having this extra stick handy makes a lot of sense. Um, but there are some diehard note users, and especially for accessibility, someone who might not want to or be able to in, in, engage with a smartphone screen in the same way that people traditionally would, having that stylus immediately accessible to fine point touch and control aspects of the UI and navigation. Again, I, all of this makes sense to me, but note should always be a niche product. It should be a hyper-focused productivity monster device. That's what the Note should be. Your general consumer needs easily met on a Galaxy S. Go to the Note for a specificity of Samsung at the top of their productivity game. And, and that's where I want the Note to be. I don't want the Note to feel like a watered down Galaxy S with an S Pen. I want them to, to always be bringing um, the, the core uh, products and services that would enable business on the go. But now the Galaxy S21 covers most of that. You just don't have the stylus built into the phone. <laughs> and ER 1980, Samsung is, is feature rec rich if you also compare it for things like DeX, which I wish Samsung would give us a proper DeX dock because um, I, I love my Nex dock and there's no reason why they couldn't make a DeX dock. But I wanted to close this out because you know, for, for talking about this and, and why Samsung, you know, for Samsung and Apple, we always see these conversations. Um, all of the air gets sucked out of the room at the most expensive tier of those manufacturers' markets. Excuse me. It's always iPhone Pro and often iPhone Pro Max against Galaxy Ultra or whatever the top tier Samsung is at, at, at any given time. You know, if it's the Note, then it's it's the Note um, occupying the majority because the big price tag is the more exciting conversation. I'm way more interested in seeing what Samsung is able to accomplish with their recent announcement on the Galaxy A52 and the Galaxy A72. Now, if tech reviewers were as as honest about average consumer needs and trends as they claim to be, we would never talk about the average consumer experience while talking about Galaxy S. 
those two ideas should never be linked. Galaxy S is a premium tier that takes us into a higher and more niche conversation about performance. Galaxy A is the jam. When someone has a more streamlined or a simpler daily driver need for communication, social media, and basic entertainment. And you know, if we look at how Samsung survived the first half of 2020, it wasn't on the back of Galaxy S, even with these amazing trade-in offers and these uh, incredible sales that Samsung could use to disrupt the market. Galaxy A51, alongside iPhone SE for Apple, saved those companies' butts. A51 was a monster seller for Samsung. And I feel represented a better strategy for what your daily driver needs might resemble. It got me excited again about checking out TCLs and uh, the OnePlus Nord and some of these Motorola's that are coming out. But when we combine that, with Samsung making a promise, we need to see if Samsung can live up to this promise, but Samsung making a promise for better and longer term software support on these less expensive devices, um, that is a critical combination. More accessible consumer price points, better adoption of some of these newer technologies like multi-camera arrays, higher refresh rate screens, 5G adoption in some markets at some price tiers, and then front-loading the price conversation in a way that makes sense for software support. I find it critically frustrating that this is kind of backwards right now. Someone puts out an ultra cheap device and then techies complain, oh, but it's only gonna get a year of updates. Well, yeah, but if you look at something like the Nord N10, tech-wise, it's very competitive against a Velvet, against an A71, um, even some of like the Samsung S lights, the Nord N10 is competing at that tier. So if you want all of that hardware and we're shaving a couple hundred dollars off of the price tag, then that compromise needs to manifest somewhere. And I'm tired of techies acting like software is free. Software costs money. There's a reason why a Pixel 4a with less stuff on it costs more than a Nord N10 full MSRP in North America. You can't make a phone with the promise of long-term support and sell it at a at a crazy market disrupting price. It doesn't it doesn't happen. It doesn't work. And so one of the things I'm most excited about for the Galaxy A series is the fact that they look like they will be more expensive than some of these phones coming out with competitive hardware. The hardware could be very, very similar, but it looks like the Galaxy A series is gonna be 50 to $100 more expensive in some regions, in some markets based on radio technology. And that's because we should then expect and hold Samsung to a higher degree of software support that they live up to that promise. I'm good spending, you know, like if, if OnePlus put out the Nord and said, hey, we're gonna raise the price $50 and give you two years of operating system updates and three years of, of security patches. That's reasonable, that is upfront, that is clearly communicated, and now we have every expectation as to how to judge the long-term life of the Nord N10. And that's what Samsung's doing here. So this is where I absolutely need to give Samsung this thumbs up. Um, they're not they're not linking it as directly, but I feel like there's a pretty good market data driven trend that we can follow. Where if you're operating and competing at the lowest possible price, we should expect that long term support and coverage and software updates are probably the compromise. You start seeing phones with the Snapdragon 888 and crazy great gaming features, but they're coming in at like half the price of an S21 Ultra. 
what do we think? <laughs> what should our expectations be on, um, you know, getting the fastest, most aggressive uh, operating system updates and, and security patches? Again, I feel like techies should be better at this than they really are. <laughs> From ER1980, the A52 and A72 would be ideal for all those who are still holding on to their SA, SA+, where the device is four years old. The last security update is due next month on these devices. And, and this is the next crazy exciting part of this conversation. Um, I want all of you techies in, in this chat right now, look at your family and friends. And, and I really want you to consider how many of your family members have increased their need for mobile compute power over the last three years. So my wife was on an LG G7, which was overkill for what she needed when she got the G7, but you don't wanna like step back too far. So uh, this year we needed, this at the end of last year, we needed to replace um, her G7. She didn't need a Snapdragon 865. She didn't need to step up to another tier, a higher tier of mobile compute power. So if she, we keep her at the same tier, we should be able to spend less. And that's now the new challenge. Like my wife is now really excited about the idea that in a couple years, if she needs to flip her Pixel 4a 5G, we can keep her at the same performance tier. We should be able to cut the price on that phone even more for her next follow-up for her next upgrade. So again, I'm looking at these, like the A72, especially it's a nicer phone. Like, you know, again, it's, it's about not compromising the overall experience to a degree that someone's going to feel I got a compromised device and I'm way more excited about A72 than I am S21. If you're coming from an S8 and your needs haven't changed significantly, you're not suddenly doing a ton of you know, graphics intense gaming, or you're not, you know, going to, to edit, you know, you know, complex video projects out in the field, stay at the same tier, stay at the same tier and save a ton of cash, a grip of money on this, on these products. I've got the, the, the write-up here from GSM Arena. I might as well screen share this for a bit. Um, Samsung announces Galaxy A52, A52 5G and A72. These are such solid looking phones. Um, it does make me a little concerned that there is gonna be a 4G model of the the A52. I, I kind of hoped that it, they would be a bit more um, Nordy in most markets where they would just, just tack on the 5G. Um, but Snapdragon uh, 7, what is it? 720 and 750s, um, 64 megapixel cameras, uh, OIS, and they call it Tetra binning, but that's basically the same name as Quad Bear. Oh, they actually say that in the article. Samsung's name for Quad Bear is Tetra binning, um, but you end up with 16 megapixel images, which look great. Again, there's a version of this camera sensor that's in the LG V60. It's phenomenal. Um, uh, 12 megapixel ultra wide, five megapixel um, depth camera, uh, and a five megapixel macro. Uh, 4,500 milliamp hour battery on the A52, and it does support 25 watt charging, but there's a 15 watt charger in the box. Uh, headphone jack, because headphone jacks are still rad, and anyone who doesn't like headphone jacks is bad at audio and bad at tech. And uh, then we also can step up to the 5G model with the Snapdragon 750. The compute power, somewhere around 750, 765, that's plenty. I mean, seriously, um, anyone who's like, oh, but I'm worried about how this is going to age. No, you're going to be fine. It's about being honest about your needs. You, If you want the latest and greatest because you want a fashion flex, then, then go spend the cash. But if it's really like, hey, I'm doing the same things on the same products, on the same services, same data platforms, why spend more? Why, why throw money or, or engage in a more expensive monthly lease that, you know, you're immediately upside down as soon as you sign that carrier contract, <laughs> you're upside down on a phone lease. The phone is not worth what you're, you're going to have to pay on it by the time you, you get through paying that phone. I just don't, I, again, it's, 
it kills me how much of this is like FOMO, you know, like, oh, but what if it's not as nice? Well, yeah, it's not. Do you need that? <laughs> did you need nicer? Because I don't think you did. Um, <laughs> uh, but again, I mean, like, and again, there, there is a conversation out there for someone who's not as critically concerned about software or might be flipping a phone, a cheap phone more frequently. And you're like, man, that, that like 300 to $500 price tier is just brutally competitive right now. And it very exciting to see, um, how all these, these manufacturers are playing different parts, different pieces, but it makes a lot of sense. Um, Excuse me. According to the uh, GSM Arena article, the A72. Oh, where is it? Oh, there it is. Um, the Samsung Ga uh, Galaxy A72 will be available soon, starting at 450 euro. And this is for the six gigs of RAM, 128 gigabyte model. There will be a higher tier model with eight gigs of RAM and 256 gigs. But there is also still a micro SD card slot on these. So if you don't need the two extra gigs of RAM, I'm sure it's going to be cheaper to add a 256 gigabyte card um, just to store all of your media. And then you can leave your 128 gigabytes of storage totally free for apps and for uh, for services. This, this looks like it's going to be killer. For all of my complaints about Samsung at the high end, for how much I don't like how they do business, their, their major concerns with um, sort of their political process and some of their their higher profile executives still in prison over fraud and stock manipulation. This is a phone that I feel very good. The A51 and A71 were so good, uh, competitive against phones like the Velvet. I mean, again, that tier really helped nudge 5G along didn't feel like you were getting this hamstrung device because it was the middle tier. Th this is where I feel most people need to be living. Um, and if it can come with the price creep for better support, that is an easier conversation for me to have with my family. Well, this phone's like $100 less and Samsung is promising. We don't know if they'll live up to this promise, but Samsung is promising better software support, better security patches, more attention. This other phone, I'm pretty sure you're going to save that 100 bucks and then it's going to be off the reservation a year later. Oh, easy. Easy. Oh, I love it. I love it. Um from F Mooney. And and again, this is this is a part of the conversation. I'm not picking on you here. I I, I agree and I disagree. It's, it's complicated. Um, from F. Mooney, uh, to enthusiasts, software is, in, is important, but for most people, updates may as well be a new phone. It scares the hell out of them, changes the look and feel of everything. Finding the settings for updates would be a mega achievement for average consumers. If I ask people who don't own iPhones what phone they have, the most common answer is Samsung? Question mark? A different confectionery when you tap the setting is not cool for most people, but that's just my two cents. I'm not great at tech. So I, I agree with you, and it's one of my critical frustrations with Samsung that every single update and every new phone comes with this steep learning curve on relearning the basics. Um, there is no through line or consistency. That being said, I don't think Apple has actually aged that well. iOS now has two completely different and conflicting app drawer metaphors you know, for how you organize the, the apps you install on the phone. The new iPhone camera app is still really messy. I don't like how they duplicate like HDR settings on opposite sides of the screen for the same camera interface. And, and you have to know that you can tap on things in the app to change those settings. It's not, there's no conveyance of, of how those features are enabled or disabled. Um, so I, I completely agree that major updates actually seem to stress my family out. I don't know what this is going to do to my phone. It's probably going to slow my phone down. Those software updates always wreck the performance on my devices um, because that has been the trend in the past. But the thing I'm really concerned about is security patches. So I want to see more subtle, less need to manage it 
but just making sure that someone who isn't that concerned about a totally different phone UI every year is at least up to date on just the core underpinnings of their phone not being wide open threats. That's what I'm hoping we'll see more of. I think we're starting to see from OnePlus, Motorola, some of these, Nokia, some of these other brands that sell the lower cost devices is, I think with Android 11 on, moving forward, there's gonna be more reliance on Google Play services updates, filling in some of those gaps to plug up security threats. So the manufacturers are gonna put less resources towards making their own over the air updates for every single bug fix and every single security patch that comes down the pipe. I think that's the direction some of these manufacturers are trying to go so that their products aren't totally Swiss cheese open holes of security vulnerabilities and threats. I'll be curious to see if Samsung getting into year three on this promise is doing more than just leveraging Google Play services updates. My guess, my hypothesis is two solid years of OTAs from Samsung, and then two quieter years of mostly Google Play services updates. I think that's the outlier that we're gonna see from Samsung. That's my guess. Um, because again, we're still not selling these products at such a premium that I, I would expect the same kind of concierge service for all of Samsung's updates and, and support. So we'll see. We're gonna have to look back, think about it. When was the last time you really took a hard look back at the software and the functionality of a phone from four years ago? I, I did that video on a Huawei Nova, looking back just at the processing power. And that was a bit of a, a challenge to work that into my review schedule. So um, I, I, think, I think Samsung is banking on a lot of goodwill We'll need to see if they really do execute this, this update strategy in the way that I think techies think they will. So, um, uh, but thank you. That, that was a, a, a great uh, comment, Mooney. <laughs> Dave Burns. I knew it. You were a Samsung shill all along. Where, where is my note? It's got to be around here somewhere. Ah. Always within arm's reach. Galaxy Note 4, love this phone. Still peak smartphone, one of the best products ever made. W literally one of the absolute best uh, mobile computing devices that has ever been constructed. If Samsung were still making phones like that, I, I think I'd be a lot less cranky pants about their recent business practices. But again, Samsung walked away from me. I can't get an active. Um, the Note is probably discontinued this year. Uh, they got rid of a whole bunch of features that I really do love uh, from their phones. I didn't leave Samsung. Samsung left me, just like Apple did way back in the day. I didn't leave Apple. I was an Apple product specialist for a Department of Energy facility. I loved Apple. Apple left me. <laughs> Oh, and the Sentinel, this is going to be a tough, I mean, again, it's a good problem to have that we have choices in competition. Um, I like how you mentioned that it's okay to pay for the Samsung premium if you know you're getting the Samsung support. And this is why I'm so torn between the A52 and the Redmi. Isn't that exciting though? Isn't that good? I want that. I want fights to happen with different tiers of hardware and different expectations for software. And that makes the entry level to mid lower mid range market so much more exciting. I'm here in the United States, you know, like I, I can make this fight happen. Galaxy A series, Pixel A series, and uh, like a Nord N10. Even just that trio. Oh, and a TCL, like even on Verizon, you can get a, che a cheap TCL with 5G support. A quartet of phones where you can really get in there and say like, hey, I don't think you're gonna care about this, but you might really be concerned about that. or your budget still might not hit Pixel 4a, but you don't want a phone that's gonna feel like a really cheap free phone, but your carrier might have a deal on a Nord N10. I've got people in my comments on my Nord video just saying like, hey, I got the phone for 30 bucks and a half a ham sandwich. You know, like get that phone. 
<laughs> where are you feeling compromised when you walked out of the door? Not on payments. You're not paying for the Nord. They got it for 30 bucks. <laughs> You're like, okay. I don't feel like that's a weak buy. I feel like that's pretty strong. So yeah, I'm I'm I, I get lit up about that because that's way more fun than just, I don't know. I picked up this thousand dollar phone, guys, and I'm like so over it, you know? Tech is so boring these days because I only talk about the things that are exactly the same as the things that I like. And then when something's different, I make fun of it. But then I don't get novelty. And I need novelty when I'm going to spend $1,500 on a phone. And no phone is worth $1,500, but they could be if I really had any kind of imagination or the ability to think about other people's needs other than my own tech reviewer um, limitations. I think that's about as good a place as any to wrap this podcast up. All right, folks. Uh, <laughs> this is going to be a week. I have so many projects that I need to wrap up and I'm working on some, some, I, again, I can't, I can't tell you too much, but I'm, I'm working on some stuff that's, that's going to be important for me, but um, it's taking a lot of time. So the biggie, if you're not on the Patreon, patreon.com slash some gadget guy, uh, Galaxy S21 camera deep dive. Those things are a ton of work to shoot, compare all the footage, put together that script, really look at some competing ideas or competing products. I'm, I'm really proud of how that one came out. Um, so if, if you're if you're catching up on the Patreon stuff, that's, that's the biggie uh, from this last week. But uh, be on the lookout. I've got a couple other videos coming out on uh, reviews.org and on my own personal channel. And I might be doing a stream with Newegg. I don't know what's going on with that. We'll have to see. But some fun tech chat. Got the OnePlus announcement tomorrow. Uh, I'll probably be live tweeting it if anyone, anyone wants to join me. We can all tweet um, hilarious reactions to OnePlus and the deluge of, I'm sure, pre-embargo videos that are are gonna drop at the same time as the announcement. Everyone sharing their hot takes on on this Hasselblad partnership from a week of pre-release software use, and then we'll probably never hear about the OnePlus 9 ever again. <laughs> so uh, stay tuned, lots of stuff to come. It's gonna be fun. I think we're gonna have a good time. So folks, uh, thanks so much uh, for jumping in. Uh, these chats are always uh, phenomenal. And uh, I, I definitely appreciate those of you who are, are supporting, who are participating, comments and sharing, and not just my stuff, but then also that whole community that's that's growing and building on uh, reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles. And, and just another quick shout out, um, a huge thank you to uh, GigaDrive for, for sponsoring this week's episode of the show. Once again, that link, uh, bit.ly slash gd some gadget guy. Kind of wish they had been able to give me a better vanity link, but we work with what we got. Um, it looks like a cool little drive, so I hope I can play with one. But I, I definitely appreciate them supporting the production on this show. Folks, I want you to have an amazing week with your technology. I want you to do awesome with your technology. I want you to be awesome with your technology. And I hope you'll come back here next week for another episode of the Monday Morning Tech Chat Show on the SGGQA podcast channel. Be well. Take care. Keep your heads down. We're, we're so close to figuring out our new normal, and it's still kind of crazy. But there's light at the end of the tunnel, and I'm so glad that you're all along for this ride. And uh, I'll catch you back here next week. Stay well. I love you all. <laughs>